Ben's Chili Bowl is one of the most famous restaurants in the District of Columbia. Not only does it serve extraordinary food, but it also has a unique and powerful history. Because of the tenacity and ability to compromise of its owners, Ben and Virginia Ali, Ben's Chili Bowl was able to overcome some of the most pressing conflicts in Washington history. The Ali's made their restaurant an important neighborhood meeting place, a symbol of hope through the years of disruption caused by racial strife and subway construction. Today, along with platters of chili dogs and cheese fries, the local eatery serves up camaraderie and good talk. All of this began with one man, Ben Ali. Ben Ali, a native of Trinidad, came to America in 1945 at the age of 18. He attended the University of Nebraska in hopes of becoming a dentist, but after falling down an elevator shaft and badly hurting his back, he had to drop out. To pay off his school fees, Ben began to work at hot dog stands and eventually learned the ins and outs of the food business. He later met Virginia, who worked in a bank in the Shaw area, and the two married. Ben and Virginia decided to open up a restaurant. They bought and renovated a historic silent movie house on U Street, near the intersection with 14th Street. The grand opening of Ben's Chili Bowl was on August 22, 1958. Business soared from that first day on because Ben and Virginia had the idea to open on the day of the annual Elk Parade. His store was flooded and business boomed. Everything was going great for the two business partners until the first of two challenges, the 1968 riots. In the late 1960s, the restaurant was swept up in a tumult and racial strife. On April 4th, 1968, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. When the news flashed across the nation, Americans were devastated. But Washington, D.C., with its many black residents, was hit especially hard. After Dr. King's assassination, it was uh, the, the, everything turned upside down. Um, my dad was actually driving home when he heard on the radio that he turned the car around and came immediately right back. Um, just worried and, and you know, just knew that, that this, this was, you know, just didn't know what was really going to happen. At the time, Stokely Carmichael, a civil rights activist who favored a more confrontational approach than King, had an office across the street from Ben's Chili Bowl. As word of King's assassination spread, angry crowds began to gather at 14th and U Streets. Carmichael led the protesters in a march throughout the Shaw neighborhood demanding that all shops and businesses be closed out of respect until after King's funeral. What began as a peaceful protest eventually grew violent. Someone in the crowd threw a bottle, breaking a drugstore window, and sparking riots that would rage for four days, marking one of the darkest periods in Washington's history. As crowds streamed down 14th Street and later 7th Street, they looted stores, grabbing whatever they could get their hands on. As the situation worsened, the Ali's feared that the restaurant would be attacked and burned down by rioters. Um, at one time, my dad always tells me that there were 843 fires burning simultaneously in Washington. So, dad basically, you know, was, would come to work and would kiss mom, you know, goodbye, and, and the kids, not knowing if he was going to see them again. Uh, we had to write Soul Brother on a window to identify this as a black-owned business, saying, hey, don't burn down this business. The family was determined to keep the restaurant open. Because of the violence, Walter Washington, who was mayor at the time, imposed a citywide curfew from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. But despite the curfew, Ben's Chili Bowl was allowed to stay open late. The reason? A compromise between Ben's, Carmichael, and the police. Both sides agreed that the activists and police needed a place to eat, take shelter, and talk while trying to restore order through the neighborhood. There was also a compromise between work, family, and money. This meant that one of them was always on the premises to oversee the business, assure stability, and to make money for the family. So that's our role. Our role is, you know, when everyone else is fleeing and, and everything else is shut down and closed up, we got to stay open. So if it's, if it's three feet of snow on the ground or 12 feet of snow on the ground, if we can physically get down here, it's not because we're going to make thousands of dollars that day. We might not make any money that day, but you got to be here because people expect you to be here. These two compromises kept Ben's Chili Bowl from going out of business and created a safe place for people to meet and plan the area's recovery. After the Shaw neighborhood was nearly destroyed by the riots, the district government wanted to help spur a major rebuilding effort. Many of the residents had moved to the suburbs in the wake of the riots, and city leaders wanted to lure them back. They decided to construct the Green Line, 
a major new branch of the subway. They hoped it would increase development in the area. But the metro construction, which began in the 1980s, brought almost unimaginable chaos and disruption into the area, threatening the survival of Ben's Chili Bowl and other neighborhood businesses. Pedestrians had trouble navigating the streets. It was hard to get in the front door of many stores and restaurants, including Ben's. Many businessmen gave up and closed their business. The illegal drug trade flourished and violence soared. The district became the murder capital of the world, scaring away tourists. The subway was the most devastating economic period we had been through. I mean, that, that went from, you know, we went, we went down to making $100 a day, $200 a day, for like four years. That was, business was a thousand times worse than, than the rides. Because there were still people on the street. We still had a street. When the subway came, we had no street. The street was dug up. The street was a 60-foot hole for three and a half out of five years. They reduced the restaurant staff so that only three employees worked on any given day. They also cut their hours because it was too dangerous to be in the neighborhood after dark. Because there was so much construction in the front of the restaurant, customers had to slip in through an alley or squeeze by the construction fence on the sidewalk. For the Ollies, the challenges were even greater than those they faced during the riots. Help came from the district government, which at the time was headed by Marion Barry, who by then was mayor. After the opening of a massive new city office building, the Reeves Center, at the intersection of 14th and U, Barry decided to offer retail spaces in the new buildings at cut rates to longtime neighborhood businesses. He figured that people working at the center would need places to eat, bank, and shop. The alley set up a satellite Ben's Chili Bowl, which generated enough money to keep the main restaurant going. That was good from the city, and that was a kind of compromise. Say, hey, we're, we're going to about to destroy U Street. Um, you know, but you can get a place up there if you want to. So, you know, it's still random. It wasn't free or anything, but Industrial Bank put a branch up there. We put a kind of a satellite business, like an ice cream bakery up there. And um, Duke's Shoe Shine was right here. He went up there. So we did have life. So up the street, that's the place that really sustained us down here. Again, another compromise involved work, family, and money. Most businesses closed up without any hope of surviving through the construction. But the strength and soul of Ben's Chili Bowl allowed the family to overcome this unbelievable economic obstacle. By insisting on staying open during the construction of the Green Line, Ben and Virginia managed to keep their business alive and to emerge as a real neighborhood and Washington institution. After the Green Line was finished, the mid-city area once again began to boom. Customers swarmed into Ben's Chili Bowl. On weekends, the long line snaked out of the front door. Virginia Ali posted a banner on the wall that said, We survived the Metro. In 1999, the alley that runs behind the restaurant was named Ben Ali Way. Today, people of all races flock to the area, but that has led to a new trend, gentrification, with new conflicts. Now some people, including the Ali's, worry that the area's long-time residents will be forced out by rising rents and home prices. Over the years, many famous people have eaten there, but Bill Cosby is by far the most avid customer, providing support for the family and business ever since his dates with his future wife at Ben's, all those years ago. Today, Ben's Chili Bowl is still kicking. Over the years, it has encountered and overcome many obstacles. And without the compromises that took place during those two most significant conflicts, Ben's wouldn't be here today. Neither of them could ever imagine that it would have been here this long or become this much of a loved place. 